consiste à euh, inspirer, euh, former et rechercher autour des clés de, de transformation que se passe-t-il quand nous changeons nos conversations. Je vous prie d'accueillir M. Ron Frey. this morning and to um, share a little bit of the experience that we are having with uh, transition ecology and using a method called appreciative inquiry, AI, not artificial intelligence. <laughs> a different kind of intelligence, maybe. Um, So what I'd like to do in this short time uh, before we have conversation together is to um, say a little bit about AI, but mostly uh, relate some stories and experiences where I think we're learning something about how to create real collaboration between stakeholders. Stakeholders who don't necessarily come to the table willingly, or certainly not with necessarily the same agendas. And how we are seeing the whole process of transition with groups of diverse stakeholders. So I want to begin with just a very um, abrupt observation. Um, It's very much uh, aligned with what we just heard. Um, when, you, when you heard Alan say that uh, we don't change from fear, um, that, that's a big statement because most of the models and tools that we use to change organizations or to develop human systems are actually fear-based. And so right from the beginning, uh, I think uh, our first observation is uh, it's not that people resist change or resist transition, it's that people resist feeling like they are being changed by someone else. And if you, if you just think of yourself and another individual who you would wish to cooperate with, but you know you have different points of view, instead of worrying so much about them, <laughs> turn the mirror around and ask yourself, are you prepared to change your reality? You would like them to change theirs. Are you prepared to change yours? Am I prepared to change mine when I'm with someone that we know we disagree, and yet the future can only happen if we cooperate. So this is a, it's kind of a simplistic statement, but I think very deep. How can we bring about transition where people don't feel that others are trying to change them? So in a multi-stakeholder perspective, the question might become, how do you engage multiple diverse perspectives, diverse stakeholders, in order to find a shared image of the future. I think we all have experienced in uh, work groups, in families, in our organizations, when we can successfully go from A to B, when we make a change, part of the success factor is at some point we do agree on a future state. We agree on a goal, we agree on a vision or a mission. Those positive anticipatory images, when they're shared, they pull behavior, they pull action. So one of the challenges in any transition is, can we find a shared future image that is attractive, aspirational, magnetic, 
exciting, energizing, that the stakeholders share as a North Star. If you find that, actually, just get out of the way. Things will move in that direction. What we see in the work we do is that humans uh, mimic the property in biology called heliotropism. That is the process or the dynamic where plants grow towards sunlight. Uh, they open during the day, they will grow around obstacles, sometimes apparently through cement and brick walls to get to where the sun shines the most. Similarly, if multiple stakeholders find that forward-looking image, sometimes we call it vision, sometimes we call it goal, sometimes mission, purpose, if they find it, they can't help but go toward it. They'll find ways to finance it. They'll find resources to do it because it's such a draw, it's so magnetic. So where do positive images come from? If, if you agree so far, or if it makes sense so far, then the challenge is, well, how do we get those shared images? Because we're bringing stakeholders together that apparently today disagree or have varying opinions about what a realistic or a exciting future goal should be. So how do we find that goal? How do we find that shared image? In AE, Appreciative Inquiry, what we're finding is you don't find that image by asking about it. You don't, you don't start the conversation by saying, um, what do you want the future to be? Uh, what do you want this community to look like in 10 years? You don't start there. You actually help the stakeholders reconnect with shared strengths that already exist in their context, that already exist in the situation. It's a little bit like the movie, um, maybe too long ago for some, Back to the Future. In order to go to the future, to find the future image, we actually start by going backwards. We rediscover and reconnect with what are shared strengths, shared success factors, shared life-giving forces that already exist amongst the stakeholders. That becomes the platform to then look at the future with new eyes. Whenever you reconnect with strengths, personally or in a group, a team, a family, a community, whenever you reconnect with strengths, immediately your view of the future changes. Immediately. Same person, same brain, same life experience. But if you reconnect with strengths, when you have been at your best, when you have been um, full of life, when you have been most effective in what you're profession or your practice is. If you reconnect with those moments, you see new possibilities immediately in the future. It's a very powerful idea. We believe, all of us, if we were all in a, a, a human system together, we're all stakeholders, uh, we're the best and the brightest, we're the A team, we believe that if we bring you all in the room and we put a whiteboard and we start generating ideas about the future, that is the best idea. Those are the best ideas. If I bring you in the room and before we do that, we simply tell some stories to each other about when we have been at our best together as a company or a unit, whatever it is, and then we talk about the future, the wall will be different. The list will be different. You will see more possibilities and more um, transitional possibilities, not just incremental. Just because you reconnected with strengths.
So this process, uh, IE, has uh, several elements to it. I'm not uh, going to go through any of the details. I just want to give you a flavor. It begins with finding the mix of stakeholders that best represent the totality of the situation or the context that you're in. I mean, it's never perfect. Uh, you know, we can't shut down a whole organization uh, or imagine a hospital. You know, people still have to be covering positions and so forth. But nevertheless, we try to get the best representation of the important voices related to our topic, the, the thing that we want to transition about. We, we start by trying to get them in the room, if you will, face to face or screen to screen, so that there is a sense of the whole working together. We don't start with a top senior group and get them all together and then pass down to the next level and the next level. We try to get the whole system represented in the room. And then the first thing we do is everyone engages in sharing stories of best past experiences, when they were most alive, when they were most successful, when they were able to be most fully themselves. We share stories and then we search for common underlying success factors or life-giving forces. And we always find them. There's no such thing as a human system that doesn't have shared life-giving forces, shared strength, shared best practices. Then we use uh, affirmative questions to bring out those success factors, the, what we call the, the positive core, what gives life to the system that you've brought into the room. And then we ask people to imagine the future, to dream. So we don't start with the dream. We, we work on what are the shared strengths first, then because we believe that we'll see the future differently, then we ask to dream and imagine, how would you like things to be? We find the most common dreams, the most common images of the future, and we invite stakeholders to choose themselves which images they most want to help make happen. They form new state mixed stakeholder groupings, and they self-manage new initiatives, new changes, transitions. And I'm going to give you two stories um, that evidence this kind of a, of a process. So one of the underlying things here is we believe in the power of the questions we ask. If we go in the direction of, let's say, um, uh, how do we uh, eliminate pollution? We are going to learn how to lessen pollution. There's no question. I mean, it's just, there's no doubt. If, it, if that's your driving question, you bring the right voices together, you're going to learn ways to reduce pollution. You're not necessarily going to transition to a carbon-free economy or to a circular economy, or to a, um, a healthy economy where everybody has a living wage. If you, you have to ask questions directed at where you wish to go. You're gonna go in the direction of the questions you ask. And it's not that one question's wrong and one question's right, it's simply you're going to go in the direction of what you are seeking to learn and study and inquire about. So uh, IE is fundamentally based on this idea of the power of questions. What is it we really want at the end of the day and what kind of question is most likely to steer us in that direction? This quote by one of our um, African-American activists Howard Thurman, 
Don't ask what the world needs. Ask what makes you come alive and then go do it. Because what the world needs is people who have come alive. One more question about low morale in an organization. Uh, one more question about corruption uh, in business or government or whatever. It's not going to take us where we actually want to be. We all would like less corruption or less low morale. But what we're really seeking is something, I think, much broader in terms of engaged employees or healthy, uh, flourishing neighborhoods in our communities. Those are the questions we should be putting out because then we will go in that direction. So another myth, uh, we change best when we're most broken, dissatisfied, and despairing. This is what Alain said earlier about fear. We have this uh, socialized, learned idea that the more you turn up the heat, the more urgency you create in people, the more crisis you create, the more sure you will be of change. It is true that when any one of us experiences, really experiences a crisis, we do change. We change our behavior. Unfortunately, it's not sustainable. It doesn't last. And it's not doing us very much good in terms of stress and anxiety. It's only temporary relief. We know this uh, neurologically and biologically with studies of our nervous systems. Um, it is life-giving every now and then to have what we call a sympathetic nervous response. That's how we cope with real crises. We, we get a pump of adrenaline, the blood goes from the brain more into the muscles and the body, and we cope. If you did that day in and day out, we would die. The, the body can't withstand that kind of uh, stress and anxiety over time. But in moments, it's life-giving. What we really want to trigger is what's called a parasympathetic nervous response, which is a future orientation, concern about what is coming next, a desire to influence what is coming next. It's an orientation toward learning. It's an orientation toward growth and positive change. That does not come about from the feelings of fear, guilt, anxiety, or stress. It only comes about from experiences of hope, joy, strength, well-being, happiness, so that this idea that we change from these states of worry, concern, and as you heard before, crises is a very short-term, if not superficial, understanding of how we actually change and grow. So our, our learning, our lesson is, is we change best when we're the strongest. Change requires lots of positive resourcing and a sense of power to do something, not power over something. If you think of a formula or an expression, this is the one that we're working with. Uh, there's always, in any moment, the presence of despair, worry, problem, perhaps crises, difficulty, things that would typically cause us negative reactions. They're always present. Also, there's always present hope, strength, passion, energy in a positive way. And what we're finding is, is if you think of a ratio, so any moment of the day, there's a degree of the despair, the deficit, the fix it, the problem, and there's a degree of the hope, the elevation, the sense of, um, of being attracted to a positive forward image. What's the ratio? And does the ratio actually predict transition? So 
We had a study of one of our uh, doctoral students, Linda Robeson. She uh, studied 10 organizations that were all a part of a, uh, they all agreed to be audited annually in their attempts to become a sustainable university campus. So th these are 10 universities that agree to be audited by an association annually in terms of their progress and their success <coughs> at becoming more of a sustainable campus. Okay? So her question is, if I can establish this ratio of positivity, elevation over negativity, despair and uh, fix it mentality. If I can establish a ratio, does it predict the success of the organization transition? Uh, very quickly, uh, of the 10 sites that she chose, four were being audited independently and were being given A grades for their progress and their achievement in becoming sustainable. Three were getting the B grade. So they, they were doing well, but they were not doing excellent. And three were getting the C grade. Average or need improvement, okay? She studied, <coughs> pardon me, she studied a website text, what the universities published on their websites related to sustainability. She studied uh, key team meetings or task force meetings. She had uh, audio and videotape of those on each of the campuses. And then she did interviews with the uh, formal leaders or managers of the sustainability efforts on all the campuses. In all those different sets of data, she had a coding process to code in the, in the talk, in the everyday talk on the campus and in their um, web-based um, you know, information they were sending out, what was the ratio of hope, elevation, strength, positive future image over deficit, concern, crisis, worry, negative future image. And as you can see here, uh, it's cut off at the bottom, I'm sorry. Uh, in all cases, the four sites that were doing the best performance, you have a high positive ratio. Three to one in the interview data, three times more comments, words, phrases, imagery, on the positive, the elevation side of the ratio versus the despair, negative, fix it, deficit side of the ratio. Two to one more in the group meetings, 26 to one more in the website, as you might expect. People don't usually put negative things on their websites. Overall, down at the bottom is the key finding. The ratio predicted the successful um, uh, campuses. The more unbiased sorry, imbalance the ratio. High on the elevation side, the top side, lower on the bottom side. So two to one, three to one, four to one, six to one. The more in that direction, the more successful they were with their ecologic transition. Talk, conversation indicates where we're going. So what is the call? How do we find this call, um, this positive, elevated sense of, of purpose? Uh, we studied one of the biggest social changes in our recent history, the end of apartheid. We looked at it from the perspective of what might be, we learn from, a, I, I work in a school of management, uh, what might we learn about managing or leading change? And the dominant narrative about the end of apartheid is actually fear-based. That all of the international pressure put on South Africa, economic pressure, 
created such a crisis for them that they had no choice but to do something. About uh, 10 years ago, there were uh, letters published. Someone found out or discovered that Mandela and de Klerk had a 14 year relationship through handwritten letters, correspondence. Again, it was published only in the 2000s, uh, the first decade of, of 2000. But this was going on while Mandela was in prison and after he came out of prison. What the letters indicate is something a little bit different, the upper part of that ratio, okay? They did not write to each other about eliminating apartheid. What they wrote to each other about and what the, histor the historians found is they shared an image about what they wanted to create. They were both passionate about the future of South Africa to be a flourishing, economically and socially flourishing country with its own identity. But they, in their letters, they started agreeing more and more on a future image that they wanted to create together. So, you know, I'm not gonna join a debate about which cause was bigger or less, but a part of the story which hasn't been known as much is the common ground that these two leaders found through their stories, uh, through their letters. And the common ground was about creating something, not getting rid of something. In my uh, hometown of Cleveland, Ohio, 50 years ago this year, uh, the major river that runs through our city and pours into one of our great lakes, Lake Erie, uh, caught on fire. The, the sludge, the grime, the pollution from the various steel mills and factories that was pouring into the river, all of a sudden just erupted one day whether it was a match of a cigarette or whatever, and we had this huge fire, the river was burning, the water was burning. At that point in time, Cleveland became nationally recognized as, quote, the mistake on the lake. And ever since then, our identity as a city has been how not to be so negative how not to be so much a mistake on the lake. We, um, we saw, and as you can see here, uh, you know, the natural reaction was we gotta clean up the river, we have to hold the companies accountable, um, we have to reduce pollution, all about getting rid of something. Uh, logically, it makes perfect sense, but it's not helping transition, okay? It's creating negative emotional arousal for companies. It's creating a negative image. The image is of the burning. It's not of the lack of the burning, it's of the burning. So 10 years ago, our mayor, uh, knowing that we were coming up to the 50 year anniversary of this infamous river burning, our mayor decided to uh, invite citizens to a 10-year project called Sustainable Cleveland 2019. We brought stakeholders together from business, community, religion, education, nonprofits, uh, what we call NGOs, uh, social organizations, and uh, we started with a group of about 60 to articulate what is the goal of this 10-year project? What is that North Star? And what they came up with, our job is to build an economic engine to sustain a green city on a blue lake. What is it we want to co-create, not what is it we want to get rid of? What do we want to co-create together? Our first uh, summit where we used the IE process, we had 700 people in our uh, public auditorium for two days. Um, out of that, 
Um, we've had 10 annual two-day summits every year since then, up to this year. Annually, five to 700 stakeholders come. There have been roughly 20 to 30 working groups. Some continue the whole decade that are self-formed in this process, multi-stakeholder working groups. They self-manage. The mayor has no money to give them. If they need money, they find it. They go partner. They go write for grants. They self-manage the initiatives. We, through this process, we created a climate plan with 32 different metrics and a dashboard in areas of renewable energy, fresh water, uh, clean transportation, local food, about eight different areas. So we now have a climate action plan with an annual audit, an annual report, feedback to the community. The next decade, which was just our most recent summit, looking ahead, uh, for the next decade, the focus areas are gonna be circular economy, renewable energy, trees and green space, transportation, and clear wa clean water. So it's gonna go on for another decade. It's, it has its own renewing energy because the stakeholders themselves own what they come up with. They take the responsibility to start action. So how can, you, how can you create a fusion of strengths to saturate and supercharge a transition? In, in those 10 annual summits, we always began with one-on-one -on -one interviews about strengths, about high point experiences since the last year. We, we always grounded the people in the room in their shared strengths. So we work on the elevation part of that ratio. Everybody knows there's problems. Everybody knows there's still things to correct and improve, but we keep working on what are the shared strengths that exist in this room. And then when you ask people, what do they want to do next? Their ideas shift. They see more possibility. They trust each other more to work together and they move in the direction of more and more collaboration. So this, this fusion of strengths is the starting point, not a fusion of ideas about the future. This is a story of a mining company. Uh, so this is on the business side. This is uh, Fairmont Minerals, then became Fairmont Central. Today it's owned by a Belgian holding company called Covia. In the US, it's the third largest producer of industrial sand. So they mine for sand all over North America and they uh, produce sand for engine block molds and things like that. They also produce sand for uh, the fracking process in deep oil drilling. They were a privately held, very profitable business they were also spending increasing amounts of money legally to defend themselves in court. They were being called into court by the Sierra Club, by environmental activists, by communities, because of the damage they were doing to the local environments, the water tables, the ecology. Um, so for quite a while, their strategy was <laughs> fend off this uh, bad will or this complaint and keep making money, okay? So the, the bottom part of that ratio, the despair, the deficit, the problem orientation did start to boil. Their own employees were having trouble at home with their neighbors. The neighbors were questioning, why do you work for that company? That company is ruining our parks. It's ruining where my children play and your children play. When that started to pressure, there was a sense of urgency, but a very critical choice was made. They decided to use IE, uh, the, this method, 
to challenge their employees, meaning all employees, the managers, the non-managers, the union, the non-union, how can we become a sustainable mining company? Now, you know, a, a quick thought might be, you cannot, those are two words that don't go together. If you're mining and digging in the earth and you're not replenishing what you're taking out, then it's not possible. But that was the challenge. Bring your people together. Don't ask them how to um, increase the efficiency of the sand delivery to, from the mine to the whatever. Um, forget about calling them together to change operations. Call them together with this challenge. How could we be a more sustainable mining company? This was the breakthrough for this company. Since then, over 20 years, they've maintained double digit growth. They've become public because of that. They have won national awards for citizenship and corporate responsibility. They have the Sierra Club represented on their board of directors and other environmental activists. And they have one of the highest employee engagement scores continuously over the years. A huge transition, just a huge transition. One of the things that was formed out of the first summit, they've done every three years, they do one of these summits to renew and re-energize what they call sustainable development uh, activities. They formed 12 sustainable development teams. I know you can't read all that in the back. Best practices, clean water, environmentally responsible products, health and wellness, safety, sustainable value chain, business innovation, empower you, that's internal training and development, recover, recycle, reuse, the three R program, social responsibility, sustainable mobility, and quest for eco efficiency. Those 12 groups formed in the very first IE summit, the stakeholder gathering. What they do today is they're a company of approximately 2,000, 20, 2,200 employees, I think. Every employee chooses a team. 20% of every employee's bonus is tied to the, achieve, the goal achievement of their sustainable development team. Now, you know, there might be 500 people on one team, so not everybody is participating at the, at the highest level. Various people step forward, take on leadership roles, and engage others as they need to. Each year, they have to put forward a budget with a plan and goals. They are audited and measured as part of the annual budgeting plan. The company has put value and valued the sustainable development activities. It's embedded in their culture. Every employee will tell you something about sustainable development from the perspective of the team that they're on. This, uh, in their 2016 annual report, they invested one and a half million dollars in the budgets that these teams put forward. They valued nine million dollars in return, mostly on cost savings, not direct revenue generation. So what they reported in their um, corporate responsibility report, a $7.5 million return on investment for sustainable development. And these are, again, I know it's small print. These are just examples in their report of things that the safety committee accomplished, things that the waste to landfill team accomplished, things that, um, uh, it's not a prosperity team. Oh, this was their community service during Hurricane Harvey and some other hurricanes that hit in the South um, East US. <laughs> they, they believe that sustainability is not an add on project. They now believe that it is part of their business identity and their business strategy. 
So they will tell you how sustainable development impacts positive customer satisfaction, positive retention of talent, positive productivity, positive safety, pre-presentism,